G'day, I'm Paul. So we know that Subaru loves taking standard cars and then jacking them up a little bit. We've seen it with the Outback and we're a fan of the Outback. I think it's a really nice all-rounder. Well, they've also got this. It's called the Subaru XV. This is based on the Impreza, but it sits a little bit higher in standard Subaru form. This one right here in Australia is called the 2.0 IS. This is the top specification before you get into the hybrids. This is priced at just over $37,000. If that's a little bit too much, you can get into an XV at the base from a little under $30,000. This competes with things like the Hyundai Kona, the Toyota CHR, and the Mazda CX-3. Today, we're going to do a detailed review to see if it's any good. If you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use those time codes up on the screen there. Or if you're on YouTube, just scroll down and you'll see the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you hit subscribe and press the bell icon. That way you can find out every single time we drive a yellow or whatever colored car that is. Okay, let's talk design. So you've got nine exterior colors to pick from and they're all free, which is great. Let me know, um, do you guys find that information useful? How many colors there are? Well, use your feedback to decide whether we include it in future videos or not. Now, in terms of the design of this, I have a bit of a soft spot for these because they buck the trend of SUVs and it means that you can have something the size of a hatchback to drive in and around the city, but also something that's versatile enough to use off-road because this is permanent all-wheel drive as well. And yes, it's not going to climb Mount Everest, but you can do a bit of light off-roading if you go camping and stuff like that. Now let's have a look at some of the design highlights. So this is obviously quite an outrageous colour. Uh, let me know what colour you think it is because here in person it looks yellow but it's also got like a deep green tinge to it as well so um, let me know what you think now in terms of the design you've got this grill down the front here that has a matte finish on it they haven't gone to town with chrome here and i think that's a good thing because it really gives this kind of that rugged look as opposed to being that luxury look but on the same token it still looks nice and classy as well same trend continues down the bottom here where they've got that brushed plastic feature over here with the headlights you have full led headlights with led daytime running lights you've got headlight washers these are becoming a little rarer on cars these days and then a fog light down the bottom there if we whip around to the side here you've got 18 inch alloy wheels on a highway terrain tire i really like this design so have a look at how they've integrated what looks like an r into the top there and that's got that chrome finish on it and then it's black on the inside so it really makes the car stand out nicely similar to the outback they've got these wheel arch cladding things that basically aren't uniform so they start small there and then they get wider as they go and then sort of chisel in around the back a lot of you said that you weren't really a big fan of those on the outback do you also dislike the treatment here i'm keen to see what you think now if we move around to the side of the car you can see that black highlight continues under that wing mirror there and that cladding continues down the side of the car on the outback you actually have outback written here but on the XV, they don't really have anything on there. You've got these roof rails that sit nicely on top of the car, and this top spec also comes with a sunroof, privacy glass, more wheel arch cladding. Now, if you come around to the rear, you'll see a spoiler up on the top there. You've got these nice looking tail lights, XV badges, more of that black cladding with a reflector lamp in there. And then instead of going with a black diffuser, they've kind of integrated a diffuser style material here that matches the car's body color. So I like the XV. Let me know what you think. Do you think it's overstyled? Would you rather just get an SUV? I want to know what your thoughts are. Okay, we're inside the Subaru XV and here is the key. You have lock, unlock, boot. The unlock is the Subaru badge there. Nothing on the back and then you have like a brushed aluminium section on the side. It's a proximity sensing key, so leave that in your pocket and you have a push button start over on this side. Now, what about the styling? Um, I think it's nicely presented. All of this stuff is rubber. It's got these uh, sort of stitched inlays. It actually looks pretty nice. So this is at the higher end of the price tag for hatchbacks or SUV style hatchbacks. So, uh, you know, I think it does actually need to look pretty cool. And, and I think they've ticked that box. This all looks a little bit complicated with all the screens here, but I suspect they'll end up going down the path of what they've done in the new Outback where you get that big uh, sort of portrait screen. Not loving all the piano black. It's here, here, along here, around there. And as you know, piano black marks pretty easily and is a little bit difficult to keep clean at times. Now, what about all the touch points? So on the center here, that is super soft. And then you have soft on the doors there too. How soft is it? Well, we've got our durometer. We've tested the main surfaces in this car. If you want to see how this compares to other cars that we've tested before, use the link in the description. And what about build quality? 
Yeah, look, that all feels pretty nice and solid. I may as well call out while I'm here the uh, faux carbon fibre along the doors there. Very sporty looking. Let's talk infotainment. So this is an eight inch color infotainment system. We have a detailed review of this. If you wanna click up here, you can watch that. But today I'll take you through a brief overview. Uh, let's start with the basics. That's your home screen there. You have some shortcut buttons directly beneath it. And then you can customize these menus in terms of what appears and which shortcuts you have on display. On the radio front, you have AM, FM, DAB plus digital radio, so full coverage there. And in terms of smartphone mirroring, you have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. This is what Apple CarPlay looks like. Full screen integration, nice and high resolution and fairly quick as well. Let's have a look at what Android Auto looks like. There it is there, it looks nice and sharp. All very straightforward. In terms of other features you've got, you also have inbuilt satellite navigation and voice recognition. Keep in mind as well that the voice recognition will forward commands through to your phone as well for smarter interpretation. Now, in addition to the infotainment screen, you've got another screen at the top there that contains things like the safety systems. You've got trip computer, what the all-wheel drive system's doing. Um, it, it's an interesting way of doing things. So normally you would just integrate all of that ahead of the driver or on the infotainment screen, but they've moved it up there. It seems to work fairly well and it gives you all of the information you need whenever you need it. That's also where you're going to find some of the extra cameras that I'll run you through shortly. Okay, moving on to safety technology. So you have low and high speed autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian detection. You have a blind spot assistant built into the wing mirror, radar cruise control, a lane keeping assistant, rear cross traffic alert, and then you also have a litany of cameras. So instead of a 360 degree camera, this does it in a slightly interesting way. Let me show you. So if I push the view button on the steering wheel, I get to cycle between cameras on the top screen. And that's pretty handy because it means that I'll be able to figure out where I'm going without having to be in reverse. And then when you do select reverse, you get the side view, which helps you with not curving your wheels. And then down here on the main camera, you get this full reverse screen. Now this is a really high quality camera. So you can see there, it's quite high definition. You only get rear parking sensors though. There's no front parking sensors, which is a bit disappointing, but you do get those guidelines there. So it is a pretty comprehensive package. And I think this is a better implementation than a 360 camera, which generally isn't very high quality. This is far more usable. And I think that drivers are going to prefer this kind of setup. Okay, so I'm gonna interrupt the video just for one second. Um, Subaru owners that are watching this, tell me in the comments section below, what is Subaru ownership like? Is it good? Are you happy with them? Are they doing everything you want them to do? What could they do better? I'm keen to hear from Subaru owners. I wanna know what the fuss is about the brand. Moving on to comfort. So uh, I forgot to mention earlier that Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are both wired, so not a wireless setup. In terms of connectivity though, you have two 2.1 amp USB ports up the front here with an auxiliary input. You also have a 12 volt outlet. And then if you dive into the center console, you have another two 2.1 amp USB A ports and another 12 volt outlet. So you are fully covered here in terms of your power requirements. Where you're gonna store your things, so your phone can easily fit in the cup holders and then it fits down the front there as well. There's like a gripped tab to hold it in. Coffee cups, mm, you gotta be careful. Even though you've got teeth, they sort of sit quite high and it means you might take the lid off as you go grabbing that and spill coffee everywhere. Uh, bottle storage, bottle easily fits in there and then the little retractable lips stop it from coming out. Then inside the door, you also have storage for a bottle and other odds and ends as well. The center console itself is massive. It's really nice and deep. And you also have plenty of room in there to put your bits and pieces, although that won't quite close, but it is quite a big compartment. And then down here you have the glove box, which is fairly decent sized. Let's talk comfort. So you have dual zone automatic climate control. You have heated seats for the first row. You have electric seat adjustment for the driver with memory as well. In terms of the seats themselves, I reckon they're really cool. So the design, I love, you've got those perforated sections in the center that stops you kind of sticking to the seat on hot days. You also get that contrast stitching. The seats themselves hug you in nicely and they're really comfy when you sit in them. Steering wheel as well, you get that um, orange highlight in there with the paddle shifters. It's quite a sporty looking steering wheel. All of these controls are easy to reach from the drive seat and you have a big old sunroof here on the top spec as well. We're in the back seat of the XV. Let's talk about space. So I've got 
pretty decent amount of knee room, heaps of toe room, and headroom is okay. It's a little compromised off to the side there, but keep in mind, this seat's quite far back, so I'm surprised at how much leg room I actually have here compared to some of the small SUVs on the market. In terms of creature comforts, let's have a look. So you've got a center armrest there with two cup holders pop your bottle in there you've also got bottle storage in the doors as well there's no center air vents or usb charging here which is a little bit disappointing you do get matte pockets or matte pocket rather just here i was expecting to see one there now the interesting thing here is yes you have isofix points on the two outboard seats but you have to construct this seat belt yourself basically for the center passenger so eh, i don't love that system I just wish they had like a normal seat belt set up. And it is also worth pointing out, you get that same seat design. So you get those perforations and also the highlight stitching just here. One of the downsides to this not being an SUV is that you don't get a great deal of cargo space, no power tailgate either. Uh, just here, you've got a little over 300 litres of cargo space and visually you can tell that there isn't a huge amount of room there. So I'll show you what it looks like with the bags in a sec. Uh, you've got a little light on the side there, you've got some hooks and then beneath the cargo floor, you have a space saver spare tyre. Let's drop our bags in, see what that looks like. There's one. So that doesn't fit long ways, but sideways it fits in. And then if you do need a little bit more room, you can ditch that. Look at that, I've made that completely dirty. <sighs> My wife would be unimpressed. <laughs> you can drop this then, and that expands the space to just over 750 litres. So what is the Subaru XV like to drive? We'll start off with what is powering this, and it is a two litre naturally aspirated petrol engine. It makes 115 kilowatts of power and 196 newton meters of torque. Now, if that doesn't sound like much, that's because it isn't much. So the reason I laugh a little bit there is because one of the biggest issues we've had with this car previously is that it was always just a little bit gutless and that's kind of what's happening here. It's all mated to a continuously variable transmission, which means it has no defined gears. Yes, you can put it into a manual mode where it has a set number of gear ratios, but for the most part, if you nail it, it will just make a whole bunch of noise and sit within its peak torque band. If I do that now, yeah, I, I think it's safe to say that the speed is leisurely rather than fast. So you're not really going to notice that when you're in the car on your own, but if you do have friends in the car and you've got it loaded up with gear, it's probably gonna become a little bit more evident. Subaru claims a combined fuel economy of seven liters per 100 Ks. Let's see what we're sitting at. 7.3, hey, that's not too bad. So that's pretty much bang on the official claim. Yes, it is a smaller engine, which means it's not gonna have as much punch, but the upshot is that you're not gonna use a great deal of fuel while you're driving around. You've only got two drive modes to pick from and you select them here on the steering wheel. You have your standard mode and then one push of that button puts it into SI drive. You can see the revs climb immediately. And then when I get on the throttle, it's more eager to jump up and give me more revs. So that is an easy transition between those modes. Subaru claims a zero to 100 time of 10.4 seconds. We put it up against our stopwatch and this is how it went. Let's move on to ride. Now, this is one of the things that I praise the Subaru Outback for. Now, if you wanna watch our Subaru Outback review, click up here to watch that one. I praise the Outback for its ride because it was just really well-tuned, really nice and compliant, and just handled country roads well. Well, it's a similar story here in the XV. It just feels nice and compliant. It's not too firm, it's not too soft, it's right there in the middle, and it means that when you are soaking up some country miles like this, everything feels nice and comfortable. There is, though, quite a bit of tyre noise, and you'll notice it more when you're on the coarse chip sections of road. It just comes into the cabin, and it can be a little bit unpleasant, but if you turn the stereo up, it drowns a little bit of that out. Let's talk handling. So, it sits a little bit higher, but it doesn't really affect its handling. It tucks in nicely through corners, and the big advantage of this car over some other cars in this segment is that it's permanent all-wheel drive, which means you get that little bit of extra traction compared to an on-demand or a front-wheel drive car. Turning circle comes in at 10.8 metres. That's actually pretty decent for a permanent all-wheel drive. 
and it means that with a bit of luck you won't have to be doing any three-point turns anytime soon. On the visibility front, I can see clearly down the front there I have the blind spot monitor built into the wing mirror. Visibility out the rear is excellent, it's a really big envelope there so there's clear vision out the rear. And for the most part this is easy to park thanks to that camera setup that pops up on the screen there. That's going to come in really handy if you're not entirely confident with parking. Okay, so I thought given it's an XV, we should do a little bit of light off-roading in it. Um, but I'm not going to send it down the rocks because um, every like four-wheel drive we take down there, it hits beneath it. And I think that it might just rip the whole sump out of this and we'll end up with a Subaru XV that doesn't really work. But I've got this little course here. So it's got a seesaw that'll send us up 25 degrees. And then it has an offset mogul, which will test how the all-wheel drive system works and test whether traction control can manage itself. Now, in terms of the actual stats, you have ground clearance of 200 and 20 millimeters. You have an approach angle of 18 degrees, which is the angle of the face you can approach before you hit anything. That's actually quite little compared to something like a dual cab ute, which is also part of the reason you don't want to be doing anything too crazy in this, because you will hit all of the plastic on the front there. But the departure angle of 27 degrees is actually pretty reasonable. Um, if you want a better idea of what all those things mean and how four-wheel drive controls work, click up here to watch a video we recorded previously that explains it all to you. And given this is a permanent all-wheel drive, it should actually handle this fairly easily. Um, you do have X modes as well. So these are drive modes for off-road driving. So I've popped that onto snow and dirt. We've got all of our things set up there. I, don't actually, I can actually feel the hill descent control has automatically activated. Let's see how we go here. Nice little bit of tilt there. I'm liking that. <laughs> it's actually, it's funny because it feels like I'm gonna fall out of the car here. Okay, here's our crossover. <laughs> old cars seesawing there as we roll forward and then go up the other side. Now at the other end of this when we get to the offset mogul we're going to have well, two tyres effectively in the air and it's going to try and use the traction control to give itself enough movement to get out of there. So right now we have a tyre completely off the ground. I'm just going to lay into the throttle gently. So cool. That's actually getting out of there without any dramas. Fantastic. So that is a sign of a really good all-wheel drive system. I can see how it's responding to it all up the top there. Even dual cab utes, when they don't have the rear diff lock running, they struggle to get out of situations like this. So really impressive there that the XV can do light off-roading, but stuff that could see some dual cab utes stuck if they don't have the four-wheel drive modes and diff locks activated. So really impressive for a standard vehicle. So you're probably going to think I'm weird for liking the Subaru XV as much as I do, but I don't know, I'm just really impressed that you can drive it in and around the city, and then if you do a little bit of off-roading, it can do that as well. The off-road system, and the, sorry, the all-wheel drive system rather, is really capable. It has 220 mil of ground clearance, which means it has about as much ground clearance as most dual cab utes do as well. So you're going to be able to clear most of the things that they do. And because it's permanent all-wheel drive, you've got that reassurance that it's not really going to get stuck in anything that I guess isn't too serious and you can do a lot of mods to these as well to bring them up a little higher fit them with all-terrain tires if you do want to do something a little more in depth but it is let down by one critical feature and that is the engine the two liter just I don't know it's okay if you're on your own but the second you load it up and you know, put your things on the roof and whatever you want to do it starts getting a little bit sluggish so I would love to see this available with the two and a half liter out of the outback or even a turbocharged engine I think that would make this such a compelling package don't bother with the hybrid. It is pretty much as bad as the Forester hybrid, which we're really not a fan of. But if you can get away with the engine and you're not too fussed by that, this is a really good package. So let me know what you think in the comments section below. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button, share it with your friends. And if you haven't done so already, hit subscribe on our channel. But always keen for your feedback. But until next time, take it easy.